30 years ago when I was an undergrad, AI suddenly became really popular. There was this wave of enthusiasm that swept across the campus, swept across the business world. It seemed like it was only a matter of time before we were all going to be made redundant. Then AI faltered and it faded and, and just went away. Now it's back. Same enthusiasm, same promises. I wonder how well it's going to do this time around. How far it's going to be able to actually go. All AI systems have got two parts to them. The first thing an AI system has to do is figure out where it's at. That means it takes an input, this is data from sensors, cameras, and it builds a model of the world. And based on that model of the world, it has to go ahead and decide what kind of actions it should take and decisions it has to make. And hopefully these are good. But we look at the um, modeling portion, it's really an important part of the AI system because the model allows the AI system to make predictions. If the model is poor, then the predictions will be poor, and the AI system is going to end up making bad decisions. It's going to end up making mistakes. So here's a couple of questions to think about with regards to AI systems. The first one is, do AI systems, um, how do they do when they encounter the unknown? And the second one is, do AI systems have any sense of being lost or when they're lost? So I've got two examples that help explain and illustrate these answer these questions. The first example will help us understand what I mean by an AI system encountering the unknown. The second example will help us see how easy it is for an AI system to become lost. So my first example, I'm assuming that I'm going to build a drone delivery system in New York City. So clearly, one of the most important parts of this is knowing for every location you can be in New York City, how high you have to fly to make sure you don't run into buildings. So I've got a map of lower Manhattan. This starts, top of it is at the bottom part of Central Park. It goes down to the southern tip. And I've got a couple of points highlighted here, just landmarks, to give you some reference. The first one is the New York Public Library. It's by Bryant Park. The second one is the Empire State Building, a couple of blocks south from the New York Public Library. And then a couple of miles down on the southern tip is the One World Trade Center. Now, this map is actually 3D data. It's a 3D rendering of all the buildings in New York, it was done by New York City back in 2014, available on the web. It's, it's a pretty cool set of data. I use this in order to create my training data, because that's the first thing I have to have in order to build an AI system and to build a predictive model. Now, I took 50,000 randomly selected points, locations, and then calculated the heights, but I focused all of these around New York Public Library. So you can see that kind of concentric, almost target-like set of circles. That shows you where the data is centered. So most of the data is around the New York Public Library, a little bit around the Empire State Building, and there's no data down by One World Trade Center. And what I mean by known and unknown for an AI system, an AI system is in known territory when it's got training data that's close to the location it's trying to forecast or predict. It's in unknown territory when that training data is far away. So known is up by Bryant Park, New York Public Library, unknown is down by the One World Trade Center. Now, clearly, if I was trying to build a real drone system, del delivery system, an AI system for that, I, I would collect data all across New York. But this is just to illustrate what happens when we counter known and unknown. The next thing I need is a model. So I'm going to calibrate a neural net, and I'm going to actually do this 10 different times. And so what I do is I bring my data into the computer, I push the button, and it goes back and calibrates the neural net, and it trains, there's a bunch of calculations that happen in the background, then it, it gives me a formula that can make predictions. I can give any location and will predict the height of the building. And so it's kind of interesting and really dirty little secret about neural nets is every time you push the button, every time you do that, regardless if you have the same data, you'll get a different formula, you'll get different predictions. So if I do that 10 different times, I get 10 different predictions. And I did that 10 times, so I have 10 neural nets, and I want to show the difference in how well they do when known territory versus unknown territory. So we'll start off by looking at the um, New York Public Library. You can see the red dot there. That's the top of the New York Public Library. It's 190 feet off the ground. And if I take the average of these 10 different predictions, it's not bad, it's 164 feet. But if I actually plot all 10 of the different predictions, you'll see that we have the highest one at 196 feet, the lowest one at 147 feet. And that range is actually not too bad, given the amount of data I have. And I could arbitrarily shrink that range by just collecting more data nearby. Now, what happens when we move down to a place that's unknown territory? One World Trade Center. Here, the One World Trade Center is 1,792 feet above the ground. The average of my 10 neural nets, 102 feet. 
right? That's the little circle with the blue cross through it. That's not very good. But it gets even worse because if you plot all 10 of the predictions, you'll see that one of them, well, you've heard the phrase off by a mile. One of them's essentially not only on the ground, but it's essentially off by a mile. So first takeaway from this talk is that when an AI system encounters the unknown, when it's far away from its training data, it's going to make mistakes, mistakes that could be catastrophic because its predictions are going to be cat catastrophically wrong. Yeah. Now, you should say, well, this is kind of an easy example in some ways because it's easy to know how far away we are from the training data because I only have two numbers that are coming in. The location is just latitude and longitude. Right, it's street address. So it's easy to say that, yes, One World Trade Center is miles away from where all my training data is. But what happens when your input gets a lot more complicated? That takes us to our second example. So when you look at images, which neural nets are usually off commonly used in order for, to do classifications, what you've got is you've got rows and rows and rows of dots. And each one of these dots have got different numbers that tell you the color of those dots. And so if you have a high resolution image, you could literally have millions of inputs. This means that the the model that we calibrate, the, the formula that we come up with, is increased in complexity dramatically. And now it's an increase in complexity. That increase in complexity makes it so that these models actually are very fragile. They're very sensitive to small changes in data that you might present to it. So let me, let me give an example or two. This is our second example. Um, the catchphrase in the academic literature is adversarial attacks for these type of examples. And what happens in an adversarial attack is you imagine that someone's built a neural net, they've trained it with a bunch of images to do classification, and then they wanna see what small changes you can do to an image in order to fool the neural net. So it's assuming some adversary is trying to attack this AI system. So the first people that really, one of the first people that really did some of this work were a group of researchers in Japan, and they put together a model with a bunch of animals, images, and they built a classifier, and then they showed this image of a horse to it. So this image was not in the training data set, and they asked the classifier to tell what it was, and it said it was a horse. Then what they went and did is they actually just changed a single pixel. So they said one pixel, and they changed it from white to black. And they put this in the classifier and asked what it was. And the classifier came back and said that it was a frog. So this should be a little troubling to you. But it shouldn't be as troubling as the next example, because the next example, well, the next example should be very troubling to you. If you ever think sometime in the future you might like an let an AI system take over driving your car for you. So this one focused on street signs and classifying street signs. It took a bunch of street signs, and images of street signs, built a neural net classifier, then it showed it this image of a stop sign, and it was able to classify it as a stop sign. But then it took the image and just put a few pieces of tape on it randomly and asked the neural net to go ahead and classify this. And when it came back with the classification, it said it wasn't a stop sign, it said it was a go sign. It said you could go up to 45 miles an hour. Now, what's going on in these examples? What's going on is the original, the original images are in some sense close to the images that were trained. It's kind of like being up by Bryant Park in the drone example. And the other images, when we make little small changes, are suddenly far away. And part of the problem with doing image analysis, it's really hard to know how far away two images are because there's so many different parts of the input that you could change. And so the second takeaway from this talk is that when AI systems encounter something new, they don't know they've encountered something new. AI systems just don't have a good way of figuring out when they're lost. And this is a real problem. It's a problem we need to think about. It's a problem that the AI community has to find some way of solving. So one obvious solution is to collect more data, but it's not just that easy. You can't just go ahead and say, well, I'm going to collect more data, because if you collect more data where well, you already have data, so you collect more data around Bryant Park, around the New York Public Library, that doesn't help you that much when you go and encounter something new, like the One World Trade Center. You have to know when you've encountered something new and then collect the data. What typically happens? Well, what typically happens is you just do your best. You build an AI system, you collect as much data as you can, and then you run the AI system. And how do you know that you've encountered something new? Well, there's a crash that happens. And I'm not a big fan of this approach. When the AI systems crash, usually that's bad. Sometimes it's catastrophically bad. And I think we can do a better job. I think we can find a better approach to that. But I have to say that that is really kind of the default approach 
that is being used for almost every AI system out there. So what's an alternative approach? Well, an alternative approach is to try to mimic the brain in some way. So it's really interesting. Our brain is constantly making models of the world. But what I find fascinating is it's actually doing multiple models. So there's one model that's being created by our brain stem. It's kind of a quick and dirty model of our world. And there's another version that's being created by our cortex, which is more thoughtful and abstract. And then in the center of our brain, there's a portion, a part of the brain called the hippocampus. And one of its jobs is to constantly compare these two models and see if they line up. If they line up, you just kind of carry on. If they don't line up, however, you get this sudden feeling that, that something's wrong, there's an anomaly, that there's something you need to focus on. In psychology, we call this the orienting reflex. Right? So there's an anomaly, and your brain does a very quick calculation, danger or not. If it's danger, you go into fight or flight mode. Adrenaline kicks in, and you go into survival mode. But if it's not dangerous, it's interesting, You're, you still go into a different mode. You go into the explore mode. Because you want to go over and find out why it is that your two models didn't match up. You go in there and collect more data and update your models. And I think this could offer a really powerful way of thinking about how to solve the problem of helping AI systems understand when they're lost. So you could call it maybe the AI orienting reflex. You run multiple models. If the models agree, then you know in your known territory you carry on. But if the models disagree, then you know you've encountered something new. You know that there's unknown territory. And you need to be cautious. You need to actually slow down right, and collect more data. So do AI systems do a good job when they encounter the unknown? No. Do AI systems know when they're lost? So far, no. Is this a problem that we have to solve? Absolutely. If we can't solve this problem, there's a very real chance that AI systems will fade just like they did 30 years ago. It's not just that these AI systems don't know when they're lost. Um, you know, that does place a serious limit on what we can do with AI systems. But there's a more fundamental limit on what AI systems can do. And you'll notice so far in this talk, I've not actually given a name to AI. For most people, AI means artificial intelligence. For me, I think that's misleading. I would prefer to call these systems augmented intelligence systems. And the reason is that when you think of artificial intelligence, you think of human cognition, values, goals, consciousness. That's not what these systems are. What these systems are, at the end of the day, really, are tools. They're tools that are powerful. They're tools that augment our ability as humans to use our intelligence to solve problems. And if you think about this difference, it actually will help you understand the fundamental boundary that AI systems encounter. Okay. And I want to illustrate this by talking about the problem or the concept of singularity. So the idea, or maybe it's better stated, the fear of singularity is that eventually machines are going to get so smart that they're going to take over. From an artificial intelligence perspective, that's kind of roughly like saying that the supercomputer at Tesla that does all the neural nets and does updates to all the cars suddenly develops a mind of its own. Suddenly, it comes up with its own objectives, its own values, They're independent of any human, and who knows what it'll do. Maybe it will go ahead and, and tell the Teslas to kick their drivers out and converge on Sturgis, North Dakota for a big rally, some kind of big electronic car dance party. From an augmented perspective, intelligence perspective, the singularity risk is different. Because when you have an augmented intelligence system, what it does is it concentrates more and more control in the hands of fewer and fewer people. So the risk is something along the lines of some teenager in their basement. It could be anywhere. It could be Russia, China, the US, hacking into that Tesla computer that supercomputer and taking over and telling the Tesla computer, supercomputer where to send, you know, to kick out the, to have the cars kick out their drivers and go to the big dance party. And that's the risk I think that in terms of singularity we should really be worried about as a society. It's not the artificial intelligence risk of the robots taking over. Now, is AI here to stay? Maybe, hopefully. If it fades, I have no doubt that it will most likely come back. And the problems it will solve will be breathtaking. But you shouldn't be fooled. There will always be a fundamental limit to AI systems. There will always be a boundary. And this fundamental boundary is that AI systems are tools. 
That means they reflect the values of the people who created them and who use them. They don't create their own values. Ultimately, the task of determining what's valuable, what's moral, what's ethical, that's a human task. It's something that we can never outsource. Thank you.